And yet there's no will to recognize we're part of the same world, that we all want to make our country great. That's, that's a recipe for disaster. My guest today is Dr. Raghuram Rajan from the University of Chicago. He needs no introduction. He's one of the most well-known economists on the planet. Uh, welcome to AEI, Dr. Rajan. Thanks for having me. So let's start off by talking about your recent book, which is the reason for this interview, though we're going to sort of, we're going to go a little bit beyond that and get into some Indian stuff also during this conversation. But let's start off with your book and what you know, the, this idea of the third, the third pillar Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea that states and markets have somehow neglected communities. If you could just sort of sketch that out a little bit for our viewers. Well, I mean, much of the 20th century was about uh, the relative role of the state, the market, in, in an economy. And of course, some espoused more states, some said more markets. Um, and really, for capitalism to work, both are essential. But there's a third pillar also, which is necessary over and above the state and market, uh, you don't, you're not born into uh, a job. You grow up in a community, and the kind of community you grow up in matters in the kind of skills you get, your capacity to do that job eventually. And moreover, with volatile markets, if uh, you, know, you lose your job, yes, there is some state unemployment insurance, but then eventually that runs out. Where do you go to? You go to your community for support. You stay with your relatives. You stay with, uh, in the village. Um, so the community has always been important, both in preparing you for markets as well as supporting you when you fall off markets. But as markets become more integrated, more global, and more demanding of skills, these functions become more important. But the third function, which is the community is also a source of political protest. And increasingly, when people find they cannot participate in markets, they're protesting. And that, to my mind, reflects the current state of affairs. We have countries that are doing very well when you look at aggregate numbers. Unemployment is really low. Uh, growth is strong. But when you look community by community, some are doing really well, but some are really, really doing really badly. And a lot of the political protest is coming from those communities. Is there anything in particular that spurred you to write this right now? Well, it's a growing sense that something is going wrong. Uh, I had that sense as we led up to the financial crisis that we were trying to solve a problem of growing inequality with cheap credit. Uh, that didn't work. Then I feared that now that that didn't work, we'd try new methods. Uh, one of the things I feared was that we'd point at foreigners' um, trade as a reason for the problems, and we'd point to immigrants as another reason for problems. And that's precisely what we started doing. And, and, and the reality is what, what we're experiencing across the industrial world is a failure to adapt to the forces of technological change. Now, some people would argue that trade has, in fact, hurt many communities in you know, places like the Midwest. Uh, they would argue that, that uh, immigration or too much immigration, rather, has you know, hurt the wages of uh, communities here in the United States. How do you sort of respond to that set of criticisms? Exactly right. It has happened. But the answer is not block yourself off, off to trade or uh, you know, stop immigration. Uh, certainly, controlled immigration can be beneficial for countries that are growing old fast. The problem in much of the United States today is depopulation, not excessive population. Uh, there are counties that, that are finding they can't attract people. Uh, so, uh, one has to see, especially as countries get old, and many rich countries are getting old, immigration as a way to keep the stock relatively young, so that there are people in the workforce who can do the work to support the entitlements of those who are old. So that's one reason why it, it would be a mistake to completely shut off immigration. It would also be a mistake to shut off trade, because again, populations in industrial countries are growing old. As they grow older, demand is not going to be found domestically. You're going to produce for the rest of the world. That's where people are buying goods, especially the young countries of the world. So that requires that those countries be open to your goods and services. How open are they likely to be if today you erect huge barriers to their goods coming to your country? Trade is in our long-term interest, as is um, you know, immigration in industrial countries. 
And so I think the reality is how do we manage the, the problems it creates rather than how we eliminate the source of the problem uh, which has uh, many other adverse consequences. But how do you make that case to someone, say, in a small town in the Rust Belt who has lost his job either because uh, the factory that he worked in has been shipped to China, or let's say he was in software and found that somebody from India and was uh, shipped in because they could do the same job, uh, perhaps for less money. I mean, how do you make that case? You know, it's, it's a strong academic case, but how do you make that case in human no, terms? No, it's a strong practical case also. You're not going to bring his job back by preventing uh, the flow of trade, unless uh, you want to completely stop trade. Uh, and, and what I'm saying is, as, for example, you, you increase steel tariffs. As you increase steel tariffs, then you increase it to a level that you protect that job. Because the rest of the world has now access to much cheaper steel, uh, because anyway, the tariffs are increasing costs here. All your auto manufacturers uh, start getting hit, your rivet manufacturers getting hit, your nail manufacturers getting get hit. The point is that in this integrated world, you can't sort of pick and choose the industries you protect. Well, you can erect barriers around the entire country and they say, I'm not going to buy from anybody. Well, think about the cost of your cell phone then. It's not going to be, you know, a couple of hundred dollars. It's going to be a couple of thousand dollars given the amount. So, the point is, this is no solution to bring back jobs. That doesn't mean you say, hey, tough luck, you don't. You have to work with those people who have lost their jobs. Many countries do it far better than the United States. In the United States, there's trade adjustment assistance, which is really a, a, a trifling sum in some sense, and is not very well targeted. I mean, many people lose their jobs because of technological change. Four out of five jobs are lost because of that, rather than because of trade. So you need to help workers adjust, and you need to figure out more direct ways of doing that. Often that means through community effort, through effort with the, uh, with the companies, with, with corporations, uh, with the educational institutions, rather than you know, uh, thinking at some central level that there's some magic button that you uh, press that is going to solve this. It requires engagement. It can be done, uh, but it requires a very different process from the one we have today. Who do you think has done it well? Well, I mean, the small Scandinavian countries do an excellent job of what are called active labor market policies. That is, they actually spend time telling workers, Here's, here are the forces coming down the horizon which are going to threaten your work. So here are the kinds of skills that you need to start thinking about acquiring if you want to survive that. And then when workers are laid off, they get to talk to a consultant who tells them, okay, here are the kinds of jobs you can get. Which one would you like to get? Well, if that's the kind of industry you want to go to, here are the additional remedial courses you need to take in order to be prepared. So you need to keep upgrading skills. The idea that somebody today laid off doesn't know how to use a computer is just shocking. But that means that you haven't been upgrading your skills over this time while you've been at work. And that, to my mind, is, is, is very negligent of our societies. And that's something different, right? Like 100 years ago, you wouldn't have had to upgrade your skills this way. Well, it, it, the pace uh, of the requirement was different, but I, I don't think it was entirely different that uh, in the uh, f second industrial revolution, we went to chemical factories, to um, you know, uh, auto, auto factories and so on. Uh, the requirement of workers was much more than earlier. Now you required workers to know things like trigonometry. Uh, algebra because they had to calculate flows and decide you know how much to open the uh, the cocks or close them down and those kinds of skills uh, were acquired by workers in the late 19th century as the high school movement opened up high schools to to uh, to american workers in fact uh, one of the interesting things that uh, that some economists point out is at that point there's a lot of immigration from europe but many of these immigrants had uh, essentially vocational skills. They knew carpentry and they knew plumbing. But they weren't really trained on trigonometry and algebra. And the native-born American workers who had gone through high school had those skills and could get the jobs in the factories leapfrogging the immigrants. So that uh, uh, resulted in some harmonious absorption. Uh, of course, we know towards the uh, 20s, immigration stopped. Uh, but but the point uh, is that it is possible to absorb. Uh, it is possible to retrain. It is possible to reskill. 
but we need far better structures to do it. I like that term harmonious absorption because it seems like it, that's almost the opposite of what you're seeing right now where a lot of the, at least a lot of the math and engineering departments are really filled with em em immigrants, immigrants from Asia essentially. Um, what does the U.S. need to do to make this process more harmonious? Well, I mean, uh, it's not that there aren't smart kids in the U.S. The question is, what are they doing? Right. And they may not be in math why and science why departments. Why aren't they in math and science? Well, I mean, uh, uh, first, I think it would be nice to know where they are. Uh, some of them are in finance. Some of them are in, uh, um, I mean, I, I have a lot of uh, American kids in my MBA class. Um, but the, uh, the, 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 uh, the more uh, sort of, uh, and by the way, I, I didn't mean to say that uh, they weren't Asian Americans uh, sure. who are represented in that in that class of math. Um, but uh, the broader uh, point, uh, I think, is that yes, this is not so much a problem of the elite Americans, wherever whatever um, sort of uh, sub um, um, hyphenated they are. This is really a problem of communities that are falling behind. Uh, and uh, there are plenty of successful Americans in the big cities who are doing perfectly well, who are in the top 1% or 0.1% or 0.01%. But there are also now plenty of Americans who are not doing so well. Uh, they've historically been disadvantaged communities, but on top of that, we now have a bunch of communities that were doing well that have fallen off. And the question is, what do we do to fix this? And in my sense is this is a problem of development, similar to the problem of development of countries. And historically, the answer never has been, we fix it from the outside. Because often we don't know what the particular cases are locally, uh, what the opportunities are, what the assets are, what the challenges are. That's something the locals know far better. And so really this is about how do we empower communities to pick themselves up. A number of communities are already doing it across the industrial world. Uh, how do we make it easier and move it faster? Now, there may be a pace beyond which you can't go. So the, the notion that there is a magic button that you press and hair press to everything is fine. But that's the problem. For the last 20, 25 years, we've been waiting for that magic button that you press. It may not exist. So, you know, one of the reactions I get is, uh, you know, where's the magic button in your book? A and my point is there is no magic button. It's about how do we pick ourselves up in, 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 in some of these communities. What you can do is help from the outside. What you can do is prevent the flight of good people from those communities by incentivizing people to stay. Those are things you can do, but ultimately, we have strong economies. 3.7% uh, unemployment in the US means the economy overall is strong. What you need is to integrate these communities into that growth, into the mainstream economy. Fix the problem that prevents them from integrating. And that really is, is what this is about, trying to find out why, why they can't. Example, we had the Pilsen community in Chicago. It couldn't get jobs Big, even though it was in Chicago, because it had terrible levels of crime. So the first thing to do was to fix the crime. Once you fix the crime, and there was a lot of community effort involved, then business started coming in. That's a very local solution. And when I talk to community, act, uh, you know, people active in communities, again and again it seems we have a unique answer for our community. There's no template we can pick, but we can benefit from from outside help, but we have to pick up the, the pieces ourselves. So let's stick with jobs, but let's use that to segue away now from the US and talk a little bit about India. Now you've also talked about the jobs crisis or what is often described as a job crisis in India. How would you say the problem with jobs in India is different from what you're seeing over here? Um, I, no, I, th I think there are a few differences. One is that um, here uh, there's a sense of loss as opposed to um, in India where in many situations uh, there is no gain. So what do I mean by that? Here there are people who had middle class status, a good manufacturing job, a good service job who've lost that uh, for the reasons that you said initially. and and essentially have seen their economic status come down. Uh, loss is harder to bear. 
Uh, in India, some of the problems come from people seeing very low productivity in agriculture, very low incomes, saying, I want, a, I want to move somewhere better. I see on TV all these sort of uh, people in cities enjoying a good life. I want more of that. But to do that, I have to get decent, a decent income. And where can I get a decent income? I don't see uh, jobs that are secure that give me that, that reasonable level of income. So there is a little bit of upward aspiration thwarted because there is, there is no, no upward movement uh, because of lack of jobs. Uh, there is some uh, loss of status also with some of these land owning communities as uh, agriculture becomes less productive they feel a sense of, uh, of loss of the original sort of uh, source of their income. It's not working as well before as before. They also now want jobs, but, uh, but they have more of a loss of status. So now a traditional way of thinking about this, you know, the, the, the big issue in India about how do you move hundreds of millions of people from the farm, the farms tend to be small, many of them are not very productive, and how do you move them into factories? And this, of course, has been the model that has been followed by East Asia, most famously by China. Now, I've seen that in some of your writings, you seem to be a little bit skeptical of this idea that India can emulate China. Could you just elaborate on that a bit? Well, I, I'm not skeptical. I, I'm just saying that we have to be cautious that this path may be, may be narrowing. Uh, narrowing f the the traditional path was manufacturing manufacturing led e export led growth right. Um, uh, one of the reasons it may be narrowing is because increasingly industrial countries are insourcing uh, and uh, trying to bring manufacturing back, reducing the importance of labor by automating more, and then using higher quality higher paid labor. So that's, that's a process that has been underway. So that may be one of the impediments to, um, I think, uh, um, uh, to following the Chinese path. Uh, second impediment is China's already there. It's uh, uh, moving up the productivity ladder by automating more. So in that sense, it has, you know, still, um, uh, though it's losing some of its advantage of cheap labor, it still has uh, relatively cheap labor, but it can also bring in more capital equipment to make it more productive. So essentially, we'll be going head to head with China on some of these these issues. Now, it's not that it's impossible. I mean, Vietnam seems to be doing taking some of the low low end manufacturing away from China, and we should take away some of that. But whether we can climb the same path that China did may be more difficult. Now coming, sticking with this idea of manufacturing, right? I mean, some people argue that because China is becoming more expensive, uh, there's a greater opportunity. And you mentioned Vietnam. People talk about Bangladesh and other countries also. Now, it seems to me that on the policy side of this, uh, we have now had uh, three successive governments at least, right? You had two terms of the previous uh, Congress Party-led government, and then you've had one term of the BJP-led government. And it seems that on certain kinds of issues that you know technocrats and economists have been talking about a lot, so for example, labor laws, it seems to me that the solutions that are put out there um, by technocrats are just not solutions that the political class in India, across a wide spectrum, has the stomach for. I can give you another example, privatization. Privatization in India has essentially stalled for 15 years since Vajpayee was, uh, what was voted out. Uh, now recently you had come out with a set of papers on a, and, and you'd led another group, a group of uh, distinguished economists and you kind of, went, you know, where people addressed various issues, right? How, what should the next government go, how, how should the next government go about fixing these things? And as I was reading some of those, I was thinking, well, this is, this is, these are great ideas, but it seems to me that we've reached a point where what the technocrats suggest and what the politicians will accept, uh, it's almost as though you're not having the same conversation anymore. Well, I, I think there are a number of things that can be done which uh, don't necessarily impinge on, uh, on the political economy, uh, or on interests that, uh, that uh, sort of benefit. And uh, if you can do those things, well, you make life a little easier, you, you enhance growth a little bit and so on. 
you don't have to tackle the, the most difficult issues such as labor laws or um, you know s some of those other. There are some areas where everybody involved would actually benefit if the process was made simpler. Take subsidies. Subsidies, I think there are st still some interests, but uh, you know, take the well, take land acquisition. As you said, lots of small farmers with with uh, really low productive land. Uh, some of them actually want to sell. Actually, many of them would want to lease if they got the chance because they don't sell the land, but they still get some of the income. For that, you need uh, better land titling, better um, you know uh, structures that that will protect these leases if they give give them out. Um, who can be against that? Uh, we need more action. Land titling is something only a couple of states have really done well. Uh, why can't we roll it out more widely so that uh, we have a clearer sense of who owns what, uh, and then it's easier for them to trade it. Right now. A lot of the land acquisition has to go through the state because people don't really know who owns the land and they want the state to bless it by, by acquiring it for them. So, I mean, you could uh, enhance private activity considerably if you simplified titling, if, if you did the process of titling and you uh, simplified the land acquisition process. That could enhance infrastructure. Um, I think that, uh, I think it was Monte Kaluvalia who said we have a strong consensus for weak reforms. Mm -hmm. I think at some point what happens is uh, if you do weak reforms, uh, you run up against our big population dividend problem. Right. Many, many young people looking for jobs. And if you're not creating jobs at an appropriate pace, uh, they get angrier. And, and so I think given that, uh, we must recognize that the consensus has to change towards more reforms. Where do you sort of like, I mean, again, land is a good example, right? Uh, the current government, uh, it wanted to simplify land acquisition. It thought that the, some of the laws passed by the previous government were making it too difficult. It passed an ordinance, I think, a couple of times. Uh, it hit a brick wall because of sort of the political opposition was, uh, was, was so intense. So, so I guess my question is this. If India doesn't do the big stuff, because the big stuff sort of is just politically difficult, um, how far can you get uh, doing what you know Arvind Subramanian calls sort of creative incrementalism? Is, is, is that a solution? Because you could argue that for the past 15 years or so, there hasn't been that much sweeping reform. There's been a few things here or there. But if you just look at growth rates, India has done pretty well. I, I again, uh, would say that uh, uh, one of the uh, worries is we're getting deluded by these growth rates, that things are fine. I mean, whatever the growth rates are, and I think there's enough controversy about them, the fact is we're not producing jobs. Uh, the fact is too many people are asking for good jobs and not getting them, right? Uh, let us not get uh, overly lulled by, by some numbers uh, and think that all is okay. Uh, if if we do that, then uh, uh, then we're letting the tail wag the dog in in, in some sense. Uh, I think you have to. What is the objective of strong growth? It is it is that we have rising incomes, we have uh, happy people, um, we have social harmony, all, all those good things. And it turns out that uh, you know, at least f from anecdotal evidence, we don't have any of that. So now, one of the things you talk about is, you know, in your book about this is populism, right? Which is, and the fact that one of the one of the key sort of aspects of populism is uh, when people stop trusting technocratic elites. I certainly see a lot of that in in India. I've written about it. Uh, do you sort of how much does that phenomenon or so this this idea that people have, which is that, well, so what if so and so is highly educated or has all these credentials, but I don't trust them. I don't trust them anymore because for whatever reason. Um, how much does that, does that phenomenon worry you and uh, how global do you think it is? I, I think actually it's less so in, in India. Uh, I think you hear voices like that, but often they tend to have PhDs themselves well, and, are trying to, <laughs> and, and are trying to discredit other PhDs. <laughs> 
So, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's more a fight between uh, quote-unquote intellectuals rather than necessarily a fight against intellectuals. I think there's still respect for, uh, amongst the broader public in India for learning. Uh, now, uh, that said, uh, I think the point you're making that uh, somehow there's a broader sense in the world that the will of the people is what's important. And the will of the people is being thwarted by these technocrats, these citizens of nowhere. The central bank is a great example of oh, that. Oh, of course. I, I've talked about central bankers being part of the rootless elite. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it is a dangerous world we're moving to. When we actually have to live on this world, we have to deal with the common problems that are, that are occurring, such as climate change. And yet there's no will to recognize we're part of the same world, that we all want to make our country great. Uh, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. And I think we're moving sort of rapidly along that path. Uh, that's in a sense why I write this book, that uh, uh, we have non-solutions uh, from all sides. And, um, you know, I don't believe that the solution is a radical restructuring of tax rates and uh, a huge new universal basic income, or uh, that uh, it is, uh, you know, let us, um, let us stop immigration, stop trade, uh, you know, these radical solutions that are being pro uh, proposed. Um, I think it is changes at the margin, but important changes, changes that you actually uh, work on. Uh, and it may sm seem small, but in a world where we're doing nothing, uh, those small bits add up. If we were doing this for the last 20 years, we'd be in a very different position from, from what, where we are now. The problem is, again and again, we want a magic bullet, something that works in the next year. And these kinds of structural problems, you can't really have a solution which works next year you have to have a longer horizon and you have to start putting in the place the things that work over that time. Uh, the politics of the last 20 years would have allowed us to do it and would have been successful by now. But of course, we didn't, we w didn't wake up then. Now that we've woken up, let's not spend the next 20 years doing stimulus after stimulus, trying to enhance the aggregate economy when you have pieces of it dying. So final question, I'd like to sort of take a little bit of a personal note. Now, in one of your recent interviews in Delhi, you were asked a question which you've asked, been asked countless times, including by me, um, about whether you would be open to uh, taking on a more uh, an active role in government in, 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 the, in the next government. And uh, you seem to sort of, you know, keep the door open and you said that you would be open to joining a government as long as it was an inclusive, inclusive, led by an inclusive uh, party. Uh, has, should I read that? Should we read this as uh, a, a, a sort of a greater inclination to get into the hurly-burly of Indian political life than before or are we over-interpreting? No, I think over-interpreting. Uh, I think the answer to questions like that, which are quite hypothetical, uh, I mean the answer I always give is I'm very happy where I am, which is, which is really the right answer. Uh, when people ask, are you, are you, are you willing to do something for, uh, for, for India? And the answer is always yes. But uh, the, both those answers together doesn't mean that I'm angling for a job. In oh, no one says you're angling, but if someone asked you. <laughs> well, we cross that bridge when it, if and when it comes. Thank you very much, Dr. Raj. Thank you. Hey, everyone. That's the end of our discussion with Raghuram Rajan. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed what you saw, remember to like the video or leave us a comment. And be sure to check out the rest of our videos and research from AEI.